There's a lot of talk about uh, defeating ISIS, and uh, as we all know, President Obama uh, defined the goal of uh, degrading, and ultimately, first he said destroying, and then he said corrected to defeating ISIS. And the question is uh, how to defeat ISIS and whether the current uh, Western strategy of airstrikes coupled with <coughs> pressure by local forces on the ground is enough uh, <coughs> to defeat ISIS. I think it's clear to anybody that uh, you cannot defeat ISIS only through airstrikes. Um, and you have today uh, um, an odd situation where you have two uh, parallel coalitions fighting ISIS. One is a US-led coalition, the other is a Russian-led coalition, uh, not fully coordinated, you know, the Russians are not fully focused on ISIS, but uh, also target ISIS. <coughs> and uh, the question is, uh, can more be done uh, on the way to defeating ISIS? Because uh, in the West there are two schools of thought. One school of thought which I think Obama represents, contends that uh, you just have to keep doing what you do today and ultimately they will collapse. They, they are under heavy pressure in Syria, uh, in Iraq, uh, they are facing a strong coalition. <clears throat> the West is targeting uh, their military assets, their financial assets, their oil assets and so on and uh, ultimately they will not be able to withstand this pressure and they will collapse. Well, how long will it take? <clears throat> Nobody knows. It may take years and uh, the Obama administration admits that uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is something that may take uh, years. And if you talk to uh, uh, professionals in the US government, not necessarily the political echelons, you hear from all of them, also from uh, military people at SEMCOM, that uh, this is really a long-term uh, struggle. Uh, there was an article uh, earlier this week by David Ignatius uh, from the Washington Post uh, based on a conference he had with uh, some CENTCOM people and he writes exactly uh, the same conclusion uh, that this is a very long-term uh, struggle. <coughs> In the meantime, ISIS is able, is far from being contained or defeated, it's far from collapse, and uh, they are uh, capable of first <coughs> uh, fighting back, they lost territory in Syria and Iraq, but they are still alive and kicking. Secondly, they are able to recruit uh, young people from across the globe, and the, the flow of uh, young recruits continues. Uh, according to intelligent estimates, uh, it's still about a thousand a month, that's a lot. <coughs> so with all the pressure that uh, is put on them, they are still capable of uh, recruiting these people. Uh, third element, I think you have to uh, pay attention to some uh, potent uh, ISIS branches in the Middle East. Uh, I would uh, point out Libya and Sinai. Uh, especially the one in Libya, <coughs> which is expanding, uh, which is dividing Libya, and uh, which puts its eye on some uh, oil assets, and also uh, targeting uh, or <coughs> carrying out some terror attacks uh, in, uh, in Northern Africa, like in Tunisia, and so on. And they, uh, this is a branch that uh, has life of, its, uh, life of its own now. And uh, so, uh, while you may weaken ISIS in Syria and Iraq, uh, there's a branch out there uh, growing, uh, getting out of control. And in Sinai, we have uh, uh, Wilayat Sinai, the province of Sinai, uh, swearing allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, it's estimated uh, to be a force of uh, up to 1,000 people. They could be defeated, but uh, as we can see, the Egyptians are experiencing a lot of difficulties in fighting them. I don't. I think they lack um, actionable intelligence, and um, and uh, they have some operational difficulties. And uh, and that struggle, the Egyptian uh, uh, authorities with the Egyptian military <coughs> and intelligence with ISIS in Sinai uh, may also take uh, some time. 
And fourthly, while they are being pressured in Syria and Iraq, ISIS uh, inspires, and in some cases even guides their operations in the West. Uh, what happened earlier this year in, in Paris was, I think, uh, uh, extraordinary in the sense it, that it wasn't only uh, inspiration, it was operational guidance by ISIS in, in Syria. Uh, these people carried out the Paris attacks. Some of them went to Syria and came back. And they got some uh, uh, concrete operational guidance. Uh, so, and, and ISIS could uh, certainly, I think, we have to assume that they would like to do more, aspire to do more, and uh, attack the West, uh, both in Europe and if they can also in the United States. They want to show that they are under, they are withstanding <coughs> the whole world, an international coalition, the Americans, the Russians, they hit back. These people pay a price, so they down a Russian plane and they carry out a series of ter terror attacks either in, in Europe or in Turkey or elsewhere, and I'm sure they will try America as well. So, uh, while this school of thought uh, presented by Obama, namely just keep doing what you do and they will ultimately collapse, this may take a very long time, and in the meantime, all of these negative developments occur and there is a price to be paid. Uh, there is another school of thought that advocates uh, an offensive on the ground, so I, assuming that uh, American and Western boots on the ground are out of the question and for understandable, understandable reasons, one has to look at the local forces and see what could be done in terms of <coughs> uh, employing more local forces uh, to this kind of uh, <coughs> operation, and I, uh, I for one believe that uh, there are more options to be more options to be explored on the ground with local forces. But this requires international focus. It requires international assistance. It requires some uh, international contribution in terms of uh, perhaps uh, intelligence, special forces, uh, armaments, uh, and so on. In my view, the, uh, from a military point of view, what needs to be done is uh, to uh, cut uh, the corridor connecting the ISIS's capital in Raqqa in northern Syria with Turkey. There's, uh, there's a big war right now raging in that uh, region with Kurdish forces, with uh, other rebel groups, with the Syrian army, uh, Russian bombardments and so on. Uh, but that corridor should be cut and could be cut. And secondly, uh, I think uh, the, uh, <coughs> the both of uh, ISIS's main uh, centers of gravity, uh, Iraq and Syria, and mostly in Iraq, should be delayed. Uh, it, part of it was already achieved through the occupation of Mount Sinjar uh, out of their hands, but more uh, could and should be done. The most potent uh, fighting force on the ground in northern Syria are the Syrian Kurds, the YPG, and they now have a coalition with some Sunni elements, with the Sunni tribes, several thousand already, and they form the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, and I think uh, uh, they could definitely uh, be uh, uh, supported and assisted to, uh, assisted to, to put more pressure on uh, uh, the main center of gravity of ISIS in northern Syria, which is uh, Raqqa. Uh, that said, uh, obviously, uh, we all know that they aspire to uh, some kind of autonomy in, uh, in northern Syria, along the lines of the Kurdish autonomy in, in Iraq as part of a federal system. Uh, and this leads uh, to a discussion of uh, the diplomatic options that are now uh, on the table. As we all know, there are diplomatic efforts led by Secretary Kerry and, uh, and the UN uh, Special uh, Emissary, Ben Stura. Uh, <clears throat> but I think we have to look carefully at the um, uh, assumptions guiding these efforts. Uh, and I have some question marks over some of these assumptions. First of all, I think, in my view, uh, the idea that you can put Syria back together is one 
functioning entity with an effective central government, um, I think this is misguided. Uh, I am highly skeptical that this could be done. The most you can aspire to is over the long run perhaps a loose federal system. Uh, but to think that you can put this uh, broken glass together, I think is uh, should not be uh, uh, the, the guiding assumption for diplomatic efforts. And unfortunately, uh, it seems to me that at least some of those uh, Western powers um, <clears throat> pushing forward these diplomatic efforts uh, believe mistakenly that this could be done. Secondly, there is a question mark over the relationship between uh, the diplomatic efforts and developments on the ground. Uh, current diplomatic efforts are predicated on the assumption that uh, in order to defeat ISIS, you need first to achieve a breakthrough in diplomacy. And it assumes that you, you can achieve a breakthrough in diplomacy, and, and I question that. I don't think that uh, current diplomatic efforts are likely to achieve a breakthrough in the foreseeable future because you have uh, too many actors uh, talking about rebel groups. You have some like 160 rebel groups in, in Syria today. Uh, <coughs> the major actors have different and <coughs> often conflicting uh, visions, uh, positions, and goals regarding uh, what needs to be the solution uh, in Syria. It is uh, even more exacerbated today, given the uh, tension between Saudi Arabia and Iran, indeed the crisis uh, between them. Uh, and these actors cannot agree on the same vision for Syria. They cannot agree on who are the eligible actors, uh, rebel groups, to participate uh, in this diplomatic process. They only agree that uh, two would be framed as terror groups, which is ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra, the Al-Qaeda affiliate, but can't agree on many others. Uh, should some uh, uh, Islamist groups like Jaish -e Islam and others be part of it or not? Should the Kurds be part of it or not? They can't agree on any of this. They can't agree on uh, what will be the fate of Bashar al-Assad? Is he part of uh, any solution? Uh, should he go? If so, when? How? Uh, what would characterize the transition uh, in Syria? Uh, these are tough questions and they don't have an answer. And indeed, as the international community was about to uh, convene yet another a meeting uh, in order to broker diplomacy in Geneva, they will probably postpone it because uh, they don't have answers to uh, many of uh, these questions. So if a diplomacy can't yield a breakthrough, um, maybe we, think we should think otherwise, namely that uh, um, advancing the pressure on ISIS and defeating ISIS uh, would pave the way to some kind of a diplomatic breakthrough, not, not the other way around as currently predicated by uh, current diplomatic uh, efforts. And here again, I think we have to look carefully at who are the forces on the ground that can do it. Um, and perhaps if there is a, um, an agreement between uh, the US and Russia on the broad uh, brushstrokes, the contours of uh, um, of a solution, uh, perhaps uh, you can see some advance because uh, I, I believe that uh, uh, the Russians are not married to Bashar al-Assad. Uh, they are willing to discuss uh, him stepping down, ultimately not now, uh, but of course both parties will have to agree on, on the position and, and how to manage uh, such a uh, transition. So we're, I think we're in for um, uh, a long-term crisis. Uh, indeed, in, in, in the meantime, it is it is escalating. And I think uh, rather than uh, looking at Syria and saying how can we put it back together, uh, the international community should focus on how to manage this fragmentation and the various fragments and. Um, and whether or not uh, they can ultimately, uh, or let me put it in a different way, uh, they should focus first on, on uh, changing the situation on the ground, squeezing ISIS 
uh, along the lines of uh, what I earlier suggested, cutting their links to Turkey, cutting their links between Iraq and Syria, their centers in Iraq and Syria. And perhaps that could provide uh, more space for a diplomatic solution, which will have to be uh, along the lines of a kind of some kind of a, even a loose federal system where you grant the Kurds autonomy in, in northern Syria and uh, there's Sunni autonomy and perhaps Alawite autonomy, I don't know, but, but it's too early right now to, to draw the exact lines of this. Uh, one other element I would like to highlight, we all focus on uh, the military strategy to defeat ISIS, but the uh, no less important element in this uh, war on ISIS is the, uh, uh, the war uh, on the allure of ISIS. What is it in ISIS that attracts so many thousands of young people from across the globe? Uh, it's not merely uh, or mostly uh, religious radicalization. I think it's a combination based on everything I know and research. Uh, it's based on a combination of the uh, existential dilemmas or identity crisis of young Muslims coupled with a deep psychological elements uh, of the need for self uh, fulfillment uh, and, and ISIS offers them like Manichaean black and white answers um, offers them uh, to partake in uh, historic endeavor of uh, uh, reinstating the Islam's glory in the face of a decaying waste West they uh, offer them heroism martyrdom adventure many other things and uh, and and when we think about this and the ideological uh, challenge, uh, uh, there needs to be uh, a strategy here as well, not only a military strategy. And it's not enough uh, to get some religious authorities to issue fatwas uh, against ISIS. This doesn't do it. You have to uh, touch the right, hit the right buttons uh, that make young people, uh, that resonate with young people who go there and fight, and I think much more needs to be done in this field uh, as well. So, uh, to be clear, I uh, this war may take may take years. I think it requires more efforts, both militarily <coughs> on the ground, and uh, and um, a strategy to to fight uh, uh, the attraction of uh, ISIS in the eyes of. Uh, Muslim communities.